And what I'll be talking about is some fairly deep issues that arise, which go even deeper than most people really often realize or even read or hear about. So of course, everybody understands that technology is changing the scene, of course, affecting privacy, affecting business models and such like. I don't think people quite general, in general understand you know, how important these changes are and how fundamental they will be to the way our society functions. The phrase, uh, seeds of capitalism destruction, comes from Karl Marx, of course. He said capitalism carries the seeds of its own destruction. Well, he's been wrong for about 150 years so far, uh, but he may actually turn out to be right mm. as a result of the developments that are taking place right now. Okay. Uh, so, and why reason for that is not because capitalism is inherently unstable and self self-destructive, but rather the, the new tools that we have, uh, the erosion of privacy is a key element of, they enable gummy up the works, that, uh, that, uh, the incentives that really make capitalism work, especially the, the kind of uh, the market mechanism. So here I'm distinguishing a little bit. So capitalism is kind of a fairly diffuse term. The thing that really matters is kind of the market mechanism, which has become a kind of dominant mode of resource allocation in societies over roughly the last 200 years. And uh, a very important element uh, in this is price discrimination. Again, something that's going on uh, all the time, has been going on for a long time. Again, much of it is hidden. And again, I think people don't quite understand how important it is and uh, how it might come to the fore, and also the extent to which it might be abetted by the new developments which arise, which will create new forms of information opacity. I think new forms of privacy are, are being created before our eyes, even as we kind of act, um, which kind of, uh, again, accept certain of the techniques, the widespread uh, dissemination of information about us. On the other hand, they also create new levels of uh, confusology kind of, and opacity there. So that's kind of a general overview. So development of the economy. So the economy is obviously changing very rapidly. And uh, kind of a, a few ways to summarize what's happening is it's moving away from traditional emphasis on uh, kind of products and services and towards searching for choke points. And the choke points can be of different forms. For example, think about Apple. Apple at various times recently has been the world's most uh, kind of uh, value, most highly valued company. Why? Largely because of the App Store, okay? which is based like a choke point in this ecosystem that Apple has created. The App Store was actually almost a, a kind of uh, incidental byproduct. Uh, Steve Jobs did not uh, intend the App Store to be open to outside developers. It was going to be something that Apple would simply use to distribute its own creations. Um, it was persuaded to open it up, and that basically changed the world. Okay? Mm -hmm. So it's not something that was designed ahead of time. Uh, it came out in the genius of Steve Jobs. It was an accidental element of Apple strategy. So choke points are becoming increasingly important. Real uh, kind of uh, investments, real costs are becoming much less important, some things. Uh, in some sense, also, you have to remember much of what we're discussing here can be viewed positively as results of the increasing wealth of society. Goods, you know, when we talk about the costs becoming a smaller fraction of a total and the public relations aspects and the publicity and everything else and digital manipulation of images, uh, of impressions, in that case, this has always been typical of luxury goods. And as the society is getting more uh, richer, most goods are becoming sort of like luxury goods. So it's a kind of a not necessarily a negative development in some sense, but it's going to, it is leading to major changes. As I mentioned, confusology, which can also be very similar to the post-truth world, is going to be increasingly important. Sorry. So, confusology, yes. Well, actually, uh, a little bit, I stole it from Scott Adams of Dilbert Foam. He, 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 has a, he has a phrase, confusopoly, and kind of changed it to confusology. That's right. Okay. 
Uh, as usual, you know, nice creations usually don't come from out of nothing. You, know, you build on previous work, so on. That uh, was the case here. So here is a little example. Okay. Uh, obviously, many of us have traveled here, often from long distances. This is a somewhat old example, but it's still relevant. Uh, this was uh, almost five years ago, a story about high roaming rates, data roaming rates for Americans. Verizon was charging about $20 per megabyte for data. Right now, it's down to about 10 megabytes, so on. Okay. And when uh, a spokesperson for Verizon was asked about it, she had this uh, kind of uh, explanation. It's a complex system. There is lots of different layers that determine rates like regulatory and tax issues in different countries. Our goal, as always, is to provide the best value. Okay. I'll come back to this. It's actually, there are several layers to, uh, kind of to this uh, pronouncement by this spokesperson for Verizon. But a uh, data point that's interesting, roughly at that same time, there was some issue before FCC, AT&T's proposed acquisition of uh, T-Mobile and so on. T-Mobile provided some data which said that they were selling at wholesale, they were selling data services to international carriers, like European ones, for the customers who come to the United States, at about you know, 20 cents per megabyte. Okay, one hundredth of the price that's being charged at retail. Okay, and Verizon is providing the best service they can. Okay, so you can say, well, there are several questions. One is, where does Verizon find somebody who can say such things with a straight face? Well, there are lots of people who can, but a more important question, a little bit deeper question is, why do they feel compelled to say it? Why don't they say, but we can, it's a free market, we can get away with it, so that's what we're charging. But they don't say that, okay? Why? Well, because the market mechanism is actually not all that well accepted by society. It really goes counter to human nature. People are really social beings, and actually, uh, I, I don't have time to go into it when you go and read the medieval scholastics on St. Thomas Aquinas and so on on the economy. They actually, what they, obviously what they're proposing is very much different from what we do today, and that's impractical and so on, but it really corresponded much more to the social nature of human people. Okay? The market mechanism is not a natural uh, feature that evolves on its own. Natural feature for human societies has been for hundreds of thousands of years operating in groups where, yes, obviously economic elements, value elements play a role, but social obligations are the most important ones. Okay? And market mechanisms tore that apart. Okay? And so that's important. So I think that's one main reason why Verizon has a spokesperson saying such things. Now, talking about confusology. Here is an interesting data point. Everybody is talking about how you know, information is free and we have these floods of information and, and such like. Yes, but we also have floods of misinformation. Here is a data point in the United States. Uh, for each news reporter, 20 odd years ago, there were 1.9 PR people. Today, there are 6.4, more than three times as many. And indeed, when you actually look at trace careers of people, many of the reporters, news reporters who worked for various newspapers and such like, many of them have moved to the corporate side, okay, where they kind of create new types of opacity, in effect, as opposed to trying to straighten things mm -hmm. out. And this is, of course, assisted by, well, by the new tools that we have, as well as general complexity of the situation. Some things Talal mentioned right now, when we click on the accept button, we don't really know what happens. And uh, you, know, you try to read the 50 pages of dense legalese, even if you have the time and you have the legal training and you're really brilliant and figure out what it means, uh, you probably still don't understand what, what it really means because these terms of service interact with other terms of service, other things around there, and all sorts of unexpected interactions will occur in a complex system. Okay. So it's a new world okay, with information and misinformation. And by the way, again, I don't have time right now. We can talk about it during breaks. I think many people are very concerned about deep fakes. 
I think they are actually going to be a very important element in making the modern world uh, kind of tolerable to society. Okay? They will have many very positive effects too. Okay. Let's, let's skip that for a moment. So, I mentioned Markan mechanism is something relatively new to human society. Uh, so, of course, it's always, I mean, you know, people going back can trace elements, obviously b basic in uh, economic incentives uh, have operated uh, at all times in the past, but they tended to be subsumed by kind of social uh, uh, factors. Over the last roughly two centuries, uh, market mechanism has come to the fore, and that has been associated with something that uh, historians call the great enrichment. Up until about 200 years ago, uh, growth in, say, well-being, uh, growth in the economy, uh, had been very, very slow, okay? and often subject to big setbacks. You had famines, Malthusian pressure, bottlenecks, and other things arising. Roughly over 200 years, we've now entered a new era of very rapid economic growth and fairly steady economic growth. And we're talking about the great enrichment, roughly 30-fold growth in the level of standard of living. Okay. Among the rich countries, obviously, for some poor countries, it's not quite that high yet. Okay. And everybody who's looked at it historically agrees that the market mechanism has been key to it. It's basically the only mechanism we, we have for producing high rapid growth. You look at what happened in China. When did they start growing very rapidly? Well, they still, Communist Party kept the control over much of the economy by that market mechanism operate. You look at countries like Cuba and so on, occasionally when they are really desperate, they feel they need to do something, they let a little bit of a market in and so on, and that tends to work. It's not ideal, it's a tool. I'm not kind of a, a, a great advocate of market mechanism by itself, but it's basically the only tool we have for moving so large societies onto the path of rapid economic growth and innovation. And the thing about innovation, again, this is a very modern term, modern concept, embrace of innovation. When you read St. St. Thomas Aquinas, for, for people, him and other people like himself, innovation was dangerous because it disturbed social order. Okay. So it's a very different world. Again, and I think we're changing, we're facing a somewhat similar fundamental change right in the near future. And it's happening right now. So again, a little bit about the market. Here is a quote about the market. It says, the market has created more massive and more, more, more colossal productive forces than have all preceding generations together. Subjection of nature's forces to man machinery, application of chemistry to industry and agriculture, steam navigation, railways, electric telegraphs, clearing of whole continents for cultivation, blah, 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 I skip it. What earlier century had even a presentiment that such productive forces slumbered in the lap of social labor? Okay. You might think, well, did I pull it out of Milton Friedman? Well, not quite, because steam machinery, Milton Friedman probably wouldn't, would be using different terms and so on. No, this is not Milton Friedman or one of these Chicago school uh, kind of uh, ardent advocates of uh, uh, market economy. Uh, this is Karl Marx. Okay. Um, Karl, this is a part of Karl Marx that few people are aware of or, or read. So on. obviously they mostly tend to read his less accurate predictions about you know, death of, the, of capitalism, declining rate of profit, other kinds of things. Karl Marx was the first serious scholar to really study what was happening in front of his eyes okay. and to understand that the really fundamental change had happened. I mean, nobody had planned it. Okay. But the market had basically been imposed on uh, unwilling society by governments, primarily British government. Britain was a pioneer in that case. And they were doing incremental steps. And they, they didn't know beforehand what was going to happen. They were just take, you know, making decisions as they went along, facing various kinds of pressures and opportunities. And they ended up with the market. And Karl Marx realized that they really, this really resulted in a very, very fundamental change. OK, so what is this market? So uh, Adam Smith, he basically describes what was evolving before his eyes. 
I mean, so people would occasionally you know, would, uh, vote for some of these measures or advocate them, would invoke Adam Smith. Adam Smith kind of uh, already describing what was happening through this incremental process before. And to kind of to simplify things, obviously, this is a much deeper subject. The Adam Smith type market involves atomic buyers and sellers. And there's also information opacity. This is something that few people don't think about it. Typically, economists think of privacy as an impediment to efficiency. Okay? Well, because you know, you're concealing information, obviously things are not going to be done as efficiently as if you had full information available. But no, actually information of past is, in, is really cru crucial the functioning of the market, because in the market, all that happens is you have the balance of supply and demand, okay? which results in a market price. And social relations here are irrelevant, as are people's willingness to pay, individual reservation price and other kinds of things. Okay? And then you can now develop the whole theory about the positive effects of the market, of the economy. Okay, problem with the market is it's a cruel mechanism. It's a mechanism. Okay, but it's a very cruel mechanism. It's cruel to people. It breaks the social bonds. People are really used to living in kind of social environments. And it's also crucial for companies. Being a price taker is a really, really a very awkward situation. So, of course, companies have been trying to avoid it in various ways. Okay? But the advantage of it Okay, some, and some, okay, here's another quote about cruelty of the markets. So this, uh, res, uh, this reluctance to embrace the market is, characterizes not just individuals, but also companies. Inside companies, you don't really have markets. Okay, you can have social relations to govern it. And there was a very interesting Silicon Valley conspiracy involving some of the most prominent companies a few years ago, where they entered into this deal not to poach each other's engineers and so on. And why did they do it? One of the CEOs of these companies said, well, competition messes up the pay structure. No, no, we don't want, comp we don't want a market here. Okay? We want to keep this nice social relation. We want everybody inside the company to be part of this family and working for our good and our shareholders' good and other things. Okay? We don't want them to collect their market value. Okay? Companies don't like the market. As I mentioned, people don't like the market. Okay? So information opacity is a, both, a, uh, both a key strength and also a key weakness, a weakness of the market. So it, the strength is, well, again, if you're a price taker, okay, how do you succeed in the marketplace? Uh, you come up with n great new products, also lower cost. Okay? Put your nose to the grindstone and work hard at it and so on. Forget these various strategic games and other kinds of, uh, of things in there. Okay? The weakness is you can't practice price discrimination. Okay. There is a huge variation in the willingness to pay reservation price of individuals. Okay. And the market stops you. There is a market price. Okay. You go to the drugstore, you buy a bottle of aspirin you know, for, you know, uh, for, let's say, five euros. Okay. Uh, if I'm a rational profit maximizing seller, I decide I Talal shows up at my drugstore, say, ah, you did an IPO, you're now rich, for you, the, this, I have this very special price, 5,000 euros. Okay? That's the, what the incentive is. Okay? And that's kind of, again, not in such a very brazen form, but something like that has played a major role in the economy for a long, long time. Mention price discrimination is very important. It's been uh, present very long time, very often concealed. Why? Because it offends uh, human notions of fairness. And lots of examples of it going back centuries. And so you have this uh, compromise you have to reach between, on one hand, the incentive to price discriminate, and the other hand, to kind of make sure that people don't get too upset. Okay. And it's very productive. So again, I, I won't go into the details of it. Uh, it's actually very hard to get good data. 
because the practice is often hidden, concealed, again, part of confusology in action in that case. Uh, and uh, of course, practitioners don't want to reveal what they are doing. Here are some examples having to do with uh, kind of uh, open access public science scholarly publications. Basically, what it shows is over you know, about two decades, uh, greater kind of uh, equality of access to scientific publications among research libraries in North America. Basically, the profit-maximizing companies, and by the way, if, if I sound a little bit US-centric, that's natural because I'm from the United States, but many of these practices are kind of universal. The incentives, the economic incentives are universal. The major dominant commercial publishers of scholarly publications are European. Elsevier and Springer and so on, and you see them in action, they are practicing socialism, in effect. They are giving access to all of their goods to different uni universities for wildly different prices, from each according to his ability to pay, one of the basic tenets of communism. That's what the profit-maximizing capitalists are doing. Okay. As I mentioned, we're facing a situation where notions of what's socialism, what's capitalism, and so on, are getting quite hazy, okay? because there is a, quite a bit of a convergence of the two. Okay. So again, if you want to talk, I can tell you, explain exactly what this kind of charge means in that case. But there is kind of direct evidence of the social productiveness of pride discrimination. And by the way, this is something which was practiced for centuries. Again, even in medieval times, various uh, lawgivers, kings or parliaments and, and other uh, bodies, uh, city councils, uh, have uh, uh, had to make these compromises. The first serious uh, theoretical explanation was concocted very close or, or was developed very close to here by some French engineers about 170 years ago. Uh, Dupuy was the most famous one of them, often referred to as Econo engineers, where they're looking at what was happening in transportation. It's a very nice quote. It said it was about practices of railroads in France in that, those days. It says, it is not because of the few thousand francs which would have to be spent to put a roof over the third class carriages or to upholster the class, third class seats that some company or other has open carriages with wooden benches. What the company is trying to do is to prevent the passengers who can pay the second class fare from traveling third class. It hits the poor, not because it wants to hurt them, but to frighten the rich. And it is again for the same reason the companies have improved almost cruel to the third class passengers and mean to the second class ones become lavish in dealing with first-class passengers. By the way, if anybody wants copies of these slides, I'll be happy to send them to you. Okay. This is United Airlines. Sorry? This, this is United Airlines. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> the same incentives, the same practices. Having refused the poor what is necessary, they give, they give the rich what is superfluous. So again, this is an incentive to extract more out of the people who uh, are willing or able to pay more. Now that, of course, so this is market segmentation. Okay. The real goal, this is like a second, third degree price discrimination. The real goal, the kind of uh, nirvana of commerce, is to reach first degree price discrimination, charge individual, uh, each individual what that person is able or willing to pay. Okay. So I might come up with a fancy battle for Espen to persuade Talal, who's now suddenly rich and feels flush, to pay more than a usual retail customer, but it's much better, much more effective, and much less costly for me if I can simply say, no, you're rich, you've got to pay me 5,000 euros for that battle of Espen. If you're desperate, you have a headache, and you're able to afford it, pay up. Okay? And that's what privacy erosion enables you to do. Okay? Because it enables you to find out what people are willing to pay and control resale. So see, the standard, I mean, again, you read Dupuy and the, his colleagues in those days, they understood all the basic incentives. They had a theoretical understanding, but they also saw that in their world, there was no way to price, to practice first degree price discrimination 
because if I you know, demand 5,000 euros from Talal, Talal is going to turn to some beggar in the street, give him you know, six euros, tell him to buy the bad investment for five euros, keep a uh, euro for himself, and uh, Talal will have the bad for six euros. Okay? So in the old traditional world where you had just goods that you couldn't control, you couldn't really practice five degree price discrimination, but these days you can. Because these days, when you buy a particular product, you don't really buy it. You basically license it. Okay? Because you now software upgrades and all sorts of other things take place. Okay? Okay, and so again, some more things. Again, but these practices I mentioned uh, kind of have traditionally led to uh, kind of quite a bit of uh, kind of opposition. In that case, as I mentioned, it, price discrimination really hits at people's sense of fairness. The important one. Okay, so what happens? Now, so why is this dangerous? I mentioned from standpoint of standard economics, it's great. Okay, and that suddenly the incentives for the sellers is to uh, practice first-degree price discrimination, okay? because you can extract more money. The danger is that this kills the market, uh, because privacy erosion now uh, leads to uh, kind of uh, price discrimination, effective first-degree price discrimination, if you allow it to go to its logical uh, end. And which point there is an individual price for each indiv for each person, and so there is no longer a market price. There is no longer a market. Okay. Now we're going into a totally new environment. Okay. And then the, all the mechanisms that uh, people associate with the market, the, the kind of the uh, utility maximization properties, uh, vanish. Okay. Furthermore, well, that hits at the notion of fairness and acceptable and the tolerance for, uh, the, for the market that people have exhibited. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, because I mentioned people really are very concerned about fairness. So where are we going? So my view when I look at it is that at the moment too much attention is being paid to these uh, kind of dangers from the platform economies. You know, Google, Amazon and such like. I uh, should be paying much more attention to the various data brokers. So there are a few thousand of them running around and no, nobody really understands what they are doing with the data they obtain, as well as the very small players who obtain all the data. Okay. Uh, I think, I suspect many of the anomalies in the market that we see today might actually be re results of this development already. If not, perhaps it'll be delayed a little bit, but we probably will see it later. Things like this big paradox of very high corporate profits in the face of low interest rates. Paradox is, why don't people borrow money at these very low you know, uh, kind of interest rates and compete away the high profits? Well, because there are new barriers being constructed, uh, new, new barriers to use of information. Okay? Low entrepreneurial activity, Yes, we talk about you know cloud and everything else is enabling innovation at a very low cost, but in fact entrepreneurial activity has been declining over the last couple of decades. Again, I suspect it's because companies are putting much more effort and are much more effective at erecting modes kind of essentially around their businesses and preventing competition and preventing the market from uh, kind of forcing them to be price takers and uh, concentrate on, you know, kind of producing better goods and services. Uh, just a little, so yes, I have a few minutes. So let me tell you a story. Again, it's very hard to get uh, good data, large quantitative data, but I can give you a few kind of snippets. A couple of years ago, I signed up for uh, uh, wired voice telephony service on my cable, uh, uh, from my cable supplier. Okay. So in the United States we have cable TV, almost every place, and I decided I actually wanted to have wired voice in addition to my cell phone in that case. I called them up, they offered me a deal, to, I, I'm rounding things off, I don't keep things simple, $20, introductory special price, $20 a month. Okay. I said, okay, fine. I mean, there are reasons why I wanted wired voice. Okay, then I, I can tell you if you are interested later. I won't take time right now. So I took the offer, twenty dollars a month. At the end of the year, uh, I look at my bill. Uh, my rate has jumped to forty dollars a month. Okay, 
I call up the cable company and say, no, I'm not going to pay that, cancel. So I say, well, let's see if I can do something for you. Okay. Very nice, very pleasant uh, lady uh, kind of uh, talking to me. Just let me see what kind of a deal I can offer for you. And so she's looking for a deal. It, it, I looked at a watch. I walk, uh, no, actually uh, checked on my watch. It took 28 minutes. Every couple of, you know, every few minutes she would come back, are you still there, are you still there, I'm looking, I'm looking for you, and so on. Finally, she offered me, again, $20 a month deal with a few, ex a few extras taken out of it, and so on. Clearly, she wasn't looking for a special deal, she was probably reading off of a script and hoping I would just give up in disgust and keep paying 40 bucks a month, okay? Uh, I'm convinced of it, obviously I don't have uh, firm data to prove it, but this is a case where the people who, uh, I know, I, I didn't waste half an hour just simply sitting on the phone, I was doing my email or reading something and so on, in that case, just every few minutes I would respond to her question, yes, I'm still there, I'm still waiting, so it wasn't wasted time on my time, but obviously this is a kind of a measure that they are taking in order to segment the market. There are people who are impatient or who simply don't pay any attention to their bills will keep paying 40 bucks a month. And the ones who are sensitive, they'll pay 20 bucks a month. And the marginal cost of the service itself is probably two bucks a month, something like that. And the cost of that agent, service agent, she was probably time sharing between customers, may have been 20 bucks or whatever, maybe 50 bucks or something like that and so on. So here are the practices that companies are engaging. Okay? Less effort into providing real service, more into trying to figure out how to extract more information. And with more information about usage patterns, again, I think this is still at a very primitive level, they'll be able to do these things much more effectively. She might be saying, oh no, okay, this guy, Andrew Odlisko, he really hangs on this phone, uses it a lot, he really cares about the quality of via telephony, we can, we can get 30 bucks a month out of him, or something like that, okay? And in this case, she gave it to me for 20 bucks a month. Okay. But again, the incentives are changing. It's not the cable company coming to market with the you know, best quality, lowest cost price of service, trying to find out how much you can extract from a person. But that, of course, means that people now know they are being manipulated. And they know that the fairness of the market is no longer operational. And that means that they are going to be behaving very differently. So the fundamental danger is when you eliminate the market, then people might react negatively and some of the populist, semi-populist movements that we see around the world may be partially a reaction to it. People think they are being manipulated by the elite. Well, they are. Okay? Increasingly, they're not just by elite, but also by all their local barber shop or car repair shop or anybody else. Okay? And that makes the market much less acceptable. The market was not a natural mechanism. The system whereby, okay, say, Talal might be forced to pay $5,000 for a bottle of aspirin because he has a bad headache, okay, this is a system of a mafia. Okay? You know, a mafia guy comes to us and says, nice business you've got, Talal. Okay? Or, would, you, would you like to keep it? Okay, pay up. Okay? Well, we know what corruption does in two terms to, uh, to economies, okay? It uh, sort of uh, certainly messes up uh, the economy, messes up the growth rate of the economy and so on, and gets people very concerned. So that might, is very, very much, I think, where we're, we're moving towards. So conclusions, I think erosion of privacy leads to very fundamental changes in societies. And uh, many of these changes will be hard to resist. What we'll, again, I can talk about later in more detail. In many cases, what you might end up is governments being two-faced. They're saying, well, yes, yes, we want to protect your privacy. On the other hand, we want to let these people price discriminate because that's really good for society too, so on. Okay? And we see, I mean, I can cite you examples where governments are already doing such things. And so, of course, it means there will be major threats to the market, market mechanism, and uh, regulation. I think there will be much more regulation, I'm convinced. We've all talked about it. Uh, we'll see major regulation, major constraints, but it'll be very tricky to pull it off correctly. Okay? 
And if you're interested, I, again, I am happy to send you this deck. And I have some papers on this topic. And there'll be some more coming in the near future. And I'll be very happy to talk uh, to you about it later. Thank you. Thank you. My question would be, it seems to me that your thesis leads towards a problem in competition economics. To what, and so Talal talks about this in relation to the personal right to privacy and, and pr privacy regulation specifically. But to what extent do you think your thesis builds towards a big problem in competition policy and regulation and that being how this gets resolved? Oh, obviously it's, uh, it's very important for competition policy, but I think it's bigger than that. Okay, it's a more fundamental issue. So, uh, kind of uh, the standard antitrust competition policy approach kind of assumes you have a market and you're just trying to keep, uh, you know, a few big players from dominating or trying to keep the players from colluding and such like. I think this is even bigger than that. But, but yes, that, that's certainly, you know, a big element of it. Is there any hope of attacking this problem directly by just uh, uh, ruling or passing laws that say you can't price discriminate if you sell good and you have to set the same price for all buyers? Oh, but that, that kills the market. I mean, remember, this is already in Middle Ages. People discover that you, you, you can't really run certain businesses without price discrimination. See, it's such, a, such an important factor in the economy that has been present for a long, long time. No, no, I mean, that, that, that. The issue is you need some price discrimination, yes. but sort of the right, right amount. A absolutely. Well, you, you have to have, so, so price discrimination, uh, in principle, price discrimination maximizes economic output. Okay? On the other hand, price discrimination gets people upset because it destroys their notions of fairness. So what has society done? In many cases, one of the most extreme forms of price discrimination is income tax, graduated income tax. Okay? No, you don't, you don't get to hide away. No, if you hide your income, you go to jail if you get caught anyway. In that case, you have to reveal how much you've earned, and the government tells you according to a schedule. So the heavy, having a prescribed schedule satisfies the human demand for fairness in that case, but your privacy is stripped away with some protections. You only, you know, only the IRS, Internal Tax Authority, learns about your income, uh, but still you have to reveal your income. So, yes. Okay. So now the question is, uh, are we going to give uh, the local drugstore access to the tax information so they can know how much to charge Talal for his aspirin? They, they can get around it. So one of the issues would be with, the, with all the information, as Talal pointed out very nicely in his presentation, you have all this information. You don't really need, always necessarily need to know the precise data. If I know what kind of car Talal has or wh where he lives and so on, I can deduce you know, how, uh, how rich he is and uh, price things too.